thank you very much. Thank you for coming and, um, and caring, I guess, about this incredibly important subject. And Julian, thank you for caring as well and all the work that you do. Um, I thought we could start the conversation by talking about capital punishment. Actually, can I ask you, do you use the phrase capital punishment or do you say the death penalty? Are they necessarily the same thing? What terminology I just roll with the use? interviewer. So, okay. <coughs> death penalty is fine, execution, capital punishment, it's all the same thing. Okay. Can you say approximately in the world each year how many people are killed due to a court-imposed death penalty? Well, the, the only answer that anyone can give is an approximate answer. Amnesty do a lot of work uh, tracking sources around the world and their figure last year was very close to 700, but that excludes countries such as China uh, who don't publish the number of people that they kill, they don't publish that statistic. Uh, and the best estimates from people who are China watchers is in the zone of three, maybe 4,000 a year in China alone. And that's, believe it or not, a great improvement on where they were, say, 15 years ago. It would have been more than double that. Yeah. So there's various ways that China watchers track all that information. But I was in a room uh, some years ago with a room full of China experts. And I just watched them and listened to them as they debated this topic. And they settled on about 3,000. And I've noticed many times that's the figure turning up in international media. Mm. For what sort of crimes do people receive this penalty? Well, it very much depends where you are. So most of the people here would know Andrew Chan and Myron Sukumaran Sukumaran were executed in Indonesia for drug crimes. Uh, in numerous countries in Asia, there'll be uh, crimes such as murder, but probably not a normal murder, if, if there's such a thing, not a simple murder. Like if I got angry at you and hit you and you died, that might not lead to the death penalty in most countries, but mm. if there were other aggravating circumstances and so on. I asked you annoying questions, something like that. Yeah, like, or two annoying questions. Yeah. <laughs> so you've only got none left. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, part of my mission tonight is to turn this into an interview about Ed because I've been learning about him and realising what a fascinating life he leads, which is yeah. really where nice we should try. head. <laughs> <laughs> so in other countries... Um, uh, sexual uh, preference could lead you to being executed. Um, that's a hard one to pin down. Mm. Uh, we're doing some um, detailed research on that at the moment, but, you know, you, you'll read about people in Iran being executed for their sexuality, um, and in some countries it's um, the penalty for um, same-sex activities is death. Yeah. Uh, and in some countries, converting from... Uh, Islam to Christianity, for instance, might earn you the death penalty. Mm. So it varies where you are in the world. Yeah. Would you say that there's a pattern to the um, types of cultures that have the death penalty as, as, as part of their law? Not really. I mean, I, uh, there are two regions now. We have the, the Middle East, North Africa region and Asia, but, you know, Asia is so vast. How can we talk about Pakistan and Japan in the same sentence and say, what are their commonalities? Yeah. Uh, so a lot of Africa does not execute, all of, except for one country, um, Belarus. All of Europe does not execute. Mm. Latin America does not execute on the whole, uh, or virtually totally. <coughs> Canada, the Pacific doesn't execute. So mm. once you start excluding everywhere, you end up with... Asia from, say, Pakistan, China, Japan, Taiwan down to Indonesia, let's say half those countries, mm. and Middle East, North Africa. Yeah. But it's not common. You know, we can talk about political systems, religious, cultural backgrounds. Uh, for instance, Sri Lanka is about to recommence executing, um, culturally and religiously very different from the Philippines, which is trying to reintroduce executing. Mm. All of them very different from the um, state-controlled you know, communist state of China, which always executes. So there's not a lot of commonality 
uh, except the Middle East countries, I suppose, probably all those executing countries are uh, Islamic. Mm. Um, but there are plenty of um, Islamic countries that don't execute too. What about the um, countries that have fairly recently, let's say in the last 10 or 20 years, um, changed their law and banned or stopped the death penalty? What's happened with those countries in terms of uh, crime rate and uh, um, crimes like uh, drug trafficking? Well, it's very... Uh, <coughs> generally, the, the research around the world leads to the surprising conclusion that whether or not you have the death penalty doesn't seem to affect much else. Uh, so I can't give you uh, examples which everyone should go, oh, wow, so if that's the case, why don't we drop the death penalty? Yeah. The, the research gen generally shows that uh, whether or not you persist or desist with the death penalty, you don't expect major social or structural changes or major changes to uh, crime and so on. Yeah. Which you know, is, is a very good argument for abolition. Because if you're going to say, well, let's pluck someone out of a jail and kill them in order to affect change in society, you should have pretty good evidence before you do that. And in fact, there isn't. Yeah. So turning to you now and your involvement, how, at, at what point did you start? Like, what, what was your first case? Who was your first case? of a, a person who'd received a death penalty and you started to work with them? Well, you know, you, you like to think that life is orderly, but in fact, most of my life is kind of, has been chaotic and un, un, unplanned sort of things thrust upon you. And this is one of those things. I was a junior barrister in Melbourne doing the sort of work that junior barristers in crime do. And I had a lot of Vietnamese clients. Uh, Really, I'd had a long involvement with the Vietnamese community one way or another. Um, and so I really liked acting for Vietnamese clients. Mm. It's a slight distraction, but you know, your typical Vietnamese client in those days was a lovely family who he just had great admiration for, and one of the kids had gone off the rails. And so you'd, when you're dealing with the whole family, often it was very rewarding work. Mm. Anyway, I'm dealing with those kind of clients, and. In one particularly traumatic case, I got to know the interpreter, who turned out to be a friend of the mother of a boy called Van Nguyen. Van Nguyen got arrested in Singapore in December 2002. And as many of you know, he was executed in December 2005 in Singapore. So the interpreter brought Van's mother to me. I was, I mean, I'd like to say I was innocent, but really I was beyond innocent. I knew nothing. And uh, the question was, can you help? And as is typical for lawyers in those scenarios, you say, yeah, well, I can help. Let's see what we can do. And that was the beginning of my involvement in the death penalty. So up to that point, uh, what sort of crimes had you been uh, defending people against, but also you were working in the Office of Public Prosecutions? Yeah, so I had a, a, a standard career leading up to the bar as a commercial solicitor, as a, as a baby lawyer. Then I became a a junior prosecutor at what in Melbourne is called the OPP, the Office of Public Prosecutions. And then I went to the bar and ever since I've been at the bar, which is more than 20 years ago, I've been known as someone who basically does defence work. Yeah. Uh, and in those early years at the bar, I was doing cases which everyone would expect, you know, um, drug trafficking, bail applications, so the sort of things I wasn't doing were the big dramatic cases, you know, like the, the famous murder. I wasn't doing those cases. I was mm. doing what um, junior lawyers or junior doctors or junior nurses do. You know, you start somewhere and you build up your expertise. Yeah. So it was a, an enormous... I mean, to put it lightly, it was... Like it's hard to sort of state how big a step then it would have been, going from those sort of cases to defending somebody against a well, death penalty. It, in retrospect, yes, at the time, yeah. being beyond innocent, it didn't seem, you know, it was just another case that I had to focus on. And, um, you know, lawyers get trained to, to do, to approach cases with a certain methodology. So what are the facts? What are the law? What can you do? 
And in that case, within a few days, we realised... I got a friend, a, a young solicitor who started his own firm, um, Theo Megazis. I rang him up and said, I've got this case. It seems going to be very difficult. Uh, you won't get paid. And it's going to be a lot of work. Can you be my solicitor? He said, sure, sure. Mm. And uh, a few days later, I realised just the enormity of it all. So I went to uh, a bloke I'd never spoken to, but I'd heard of, um, Lex Lazary QC, who's became sort of famous in Australia, and he's now just recently retired as a Supreme Court judge. And I said, hi, I'm Julian, I've got this case. You won't get paid, it's going to be a lot of work, but I need you to help. Can you help? And he said, yeah, I'll do it. So suddenly we had a team and we're off and mm. running. And the enormity of it took a while to, to land, I think. You know, it's... Um, well, we didn't expect the client to be executed. In those early days, what we had was a difficult problem. How do we address it? How do we save the client? That was the kind of attitude we had right up almost to the very end. And um, Was that... Um, why did you expect that? Like, from, from what um, previous cases did you expect that he wouldn't have been e executed? Um, well, ignorance, certainly. Mm. Uh, you just don't expect people to be dragged out and killed. I hadn't been focused on... I mean, I was interested in human rights in the way probably that everyone here is, but it doesn't mean you know much about a lot of things. Mm. You know, I, I had never given much attention, probably next to no attention, to the death penalty. Yes. Um, and... Uh, but, you know, I'd been very interested in, say, refugees and things like that. So, you know, you kind of have a vague sense of these things. Um, I had a, a, a brand new brief. A young boy's been arrested in Singapore. He's got some drugs. The penalty is death. Uh, so you've got a trial coming up, an appeal, and a clemency process. Somewhere along the way, we'll be able to save him. Sure, that's surely somewhere along the way we'll be able to save him. That was the, yeah. probably the attitude right at the beginning. Yeah. It wasn't blasé. It was just that the fight is on. We've got to win the fight. Yeah. With um, different countries and, of course, different legal systems... Um, how do you then work with teams in the countries that, where the, um, the defendant is, uh, I suppose, getting to know as intimately as you know Australian law, getting to know Singaporean law and yeah. Indonesian law? So this is something that evolved, of course, yeah. bearing in mind, you know, I know I'm bald and fat and silvery now, but then I was carroty and skinny. <laughs> and uh, <coughs> uh, you sort of learn over time, like, yeah. um, on that... In that first week, I had no idea where all this was going, but over the years, we've developed a, an approach, which is that we Australian lawyers, there's this group of us, um, there's Stephen from Brisbane here, and there's lawyers in Melbourne uh, who, who try to help each other in various ways. And in, when we're doing something in another country, our approach is we are never the key lawyer. We always use local lawyers. Yeah. And the only thing that we do is to help them as much as they want to be helped, which in some countries, or in some cases, is not a lot, mm -hmm. and in other cases is a great deal. Yeah. And how does that change with your client being Australian? Do, do you then feel that um, an Australian might want to speak to you more than their local lawyer, for instance? Um... That perhaps the client's wishes and the lawyer's wishes are not always in alignment. It can get complicated. I don't want to talk about particular countries, but it, uh, it's just common sense that if, you, if, you, if, you, if your client comes from the same city that you come from, it's very easy to get straight into a conversation. Yeah. And if you don't have language barriers and... Uh, you have a familiar cultural history. It's very easy to get straight to straight into conversation. So, but overall, um, that hasn't been our experience. Overall, um, the sort of lawyers who are willing to help us mm. are the sort of people that people like me or people like us immediately recognise. Oh, yeah, that person could easily be doing Julian's job in Melbourne. He happens or she happens to be doing it in this other place. But mm. so. With um, Van Tuong Nguyen, who was executed in 2005, at what point did you realise that was it? There is nothing else 
I can do for him? Probably not till the last few days. Mm. But again, that was partially naivety. And what I now know about Singapore took, took more than... It, it gradually... It's a, it's a gradual learning curve. Like, for instance, Singapore has a clemency process. So in Van's case, we had a trial and an appeal. We lost the trial, we lost the appeal. But we had a clemency process, so all focus on the clemency process. Mm. People ranging from, say, the Foreign Minister Alexander Downer to officers from DFAT to the lawyers and so on. And we got other um, international people involved and so on. So you think, okay, well, we're going to have to win at the clemency stage. Now, what I now know is that no one has been granted clemency, so far as I'm aware, for 20 years or more in Singapore. Wow. So the notion that there's a clemency process is actually farcical. Yeah. But um, even though we were kind of aware of that in a way, we also felt that we had a genuinely meritorious claim mm. and that we're dealing with a, a rational system and that we're dealing with people who are openly friends of ours. You know, Australia and Singapore have very close links virtually at every level that you can name. Economic, political, mm. military, social. I mean... I, you know, a number of my closest friends are Singaporeans. And um, putting Would you say there's uh, no corruption in Singapore? Uh, yeah, it's certainly not a place where people uh, talk about corruption in the way of um, brown paper bags or suitcases full of money. Um, it, it, you know, there's, there's, if, we, if we change the word and, and we talk about... Um, the exercise of power. Um, it's a very complicated country. You know, the ruling party has won every election since independence uh, over 50 years ago. So I wouldn't use the word corruption uh, for that. That's a, a, it's a process which is described as democratic, but it's obviously much more complex than merely saying it's a democracy. I mean, show me another democracy where the ruling party has won every election for six decades. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, Julian, when Van uh, Tuong Nguyen was executed, how did you look after yourself? Um, well, I was certainly shaken in, in those few days, but as, as fate would have it, uh, uh, I was also the junior barrister at that time in a long trial in Melbourne which had been running much of the year, and it was an extremely difficult and um, tense trial. It was, a, it was a police corruption trial of a very senior police officer, and uh, there's sort of in the background, there's the Melbourne gangland wars going on. So it was, it was a really dramatic and tough trial. So like many other professionals, whether you're lawyers or paramedics or whatever you might be, you just have to get on with the job. So um, that's what I had to do. I was, we didn't, uh, we, you know, we were a couple of weeks away or maybe a week or two away from closing addresses to the jury mm -hmm. when Van Nguyen was executed. So an intense period of um, managing myself, that lasted a few hours and then back to work. Yes. And then Which is not, I don't say that to sound heroic. I mean, that's just the way you have to do things when you're in a professional environment. Yeah. And in the same year, um, the Bali Nine were arrested... And at what point were you brought in to assist with um, Andrew Chan and Myron Sukumaran? So they were arrested in, on April 17, 2005, the yeah. nine of them. Uh, they had a trial and were sentenced to death. And they were sentenced to death just as they were being sentenced to death for the third time, having lost each of their appeals. Mm -hmm. The families got in touch with Lex Lazary, who I mentioned earlier, asking him to get involved. And it, by that time, unfortunately... History now shows the damage was done. Uh, and then, obviously, then Lex asked me to help him. And so that's how we commenced our work in that case. Yeah. But mid, mid to late 06. When you refer to the damage already done, what do you mean by that? Well, the political language was our justice system works. This is what the justice system has found. And in 2000 and Six, they were found guilty at trial and lost their appeals um, before we'd ever had a moment in the case. Yeah. So that was the crutch that those who were pro-execution in Indonesia could always just fall back on. Yeah. 
Um, I'm, I'm sure you're aware of the uh, book by Cindy Wachner, uh, the, yes. the pastor and the painter. I don't know whether you have come across this book. It's, um, it's, a, it's well, gripping is uh, probably not a good word. It's a, I think it's really a, an, an essential book to read, um, to know more about the intricacies of um, Andrew Chan and Myron Sikamaran's case. But in the book, um, Cindy Wachner writes about the damage that Tony Abbott had made with his linking of the execution of Andrew Chan and Myron Sikamaran to Australia's tsunami aid. And she also talks about the phone tapping of the wife of the then president, Yudiono, and how that might have diminished chances of clemency. So with your own extremely delicate work, how do you then deal with these agents of the government and their potentially disastrous actions and comments? I'm thinking about Boris Johnson, uh, also with his acts as foreign secretary against uh, Nazanin Zaghari Ratcliffe. Yeah, that was... Let's hope that's not the way Boris carries on in the future. Yeah. Uh, in... in in uh, in my work, uh, we we have always had a very strict policy of not being critical of people and institutions. Um, I don't know how I sound, whether I sound critical of people and institutions, but our policy is not to be. So we never criticise Australian politicians or Sing Indonesian or Singaporean politicians. Um, everyone's got their job to do. We always, um, in football parlance, I don't like football parlance, so I don't know anything about football, <laughs> but, you know, play the ball, not the man. So, you know, we, yes. we, we, we try to talk about ideas and, and, and rights and wrongs and justice and so on. So mm. I, um, I've never commented on things like those matters that Cindy referred to. Mm. Uh, and, you know, it's unhelpful for me to do so. I work with whoever's in government. Yeah. Um, the public servants I... Um, work with from time to time are working with who's ever in government and if people like me kind of get involved in um, political debates then we lose the next ally that we need a year or two down the track and yeah. so I, I've always had a um, you know I mean my politics are, are, are not public but um um, you know, a couple of politicians certainly make jokes at me from time to time, assuming what my politics are, and I don't disabuse them of that, but mm. I don't get into it into the public arena. Yeah. Cindy's, um, uh, you know, she's a, 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 a very uh, experienced journalist and, mm. and um, she can hold her own in any mm. uh, debate in the media. Um, she was a great asset to us uh, in 2015 because... She had actually followed the case from the beginning and um, I don't think she was particularly enamoured of any of the Bali Nine at the beginning. Um, but by the end, um, because, she, uh, because of her journalistic experience and her skills, she was able to spend a lot of time in the prison and get to know the prisoners. Mm -hmm. And her experience... Um, of watching them change over the relevant years enabled her to write with a lot of confidence, which was very good from our point of view. We had a, a senior journalist at News Limited saying, I saw these punks and now I see these incredibly impressive young men. I've been to the prison constantly for 10 years. What I saw then and what I saw, see now is so different. Look at the good that they're doing. Here's the debate and so on. So. Mm -hmm. It's not common to have a journalist who has so much in-depth knowledge of a long and protracted problem yeah. um, uh, who's able, who has the freedom to write about it. You know, she, was, she had great contacts in Indonesia, probably second to none. Um, and so uh, I, I, I agree that, you know, people who are interested in that story, in the Sukumar and Chan story, will certainly enjoy the insights in her book, mm. and um, I know I'm rambling a bit. I, it's, I haven't spoken to Cindy for a long time, but hearing you talk about her reminds me of of the intimacy of her involvement and in watching the case. Yes, and uh, I interviewed her uh, last year uh, for the art show on Radio National, and um, she was so passionate about uh, 
all those years of, of you know, what had, what had happened to the men. Uh, she was an amazing interviewee, yeah. Um, since we're here at the Gallery of Modern Art um, to um, celebrate in a, in a slightly unusual way the work of Ben Quilty, um, when you were going in to see Andrew Chan and Myron Sukumaran, did you ever come across Ben Quilty? You know, did you bump into him or...? Yeah, I, it's funny. I, I, my memory of, of Ben is just this force of nature, but as yeah. to when I got hit by the hurricane, I'm not exactly sure. Yes. Uh, I think we... What we used to do in the prison was um, the lawyers were kind of... We were obviously very close to our clients, but at a certain level, which we spoke openly about, we were unwelcome and, and oh, really, do we have to do all this legal work? You know, mm. Eddie's coming. I want to talk to Eddie. I don't want to talk to the lawyers. And so what would happen is if Ben was there, for instance, we would typically not be there. Yeah. So with Myron saying, oh, Ben's coming tomorrow... Uh, he'll be here at 10, we'll say, well, we'll come at 2, you know. So we didn't see a lot of each other in the prison. If, if Ben was there, the last thing you want to do is spend time with the lawyers. Yes. So I've seen Ben in, in different parts of Australia and, and up there, but um, no particular time stands out in my mind. Yeah. Just taking a step backwards, sorry, I meant to ask you this as you were, as you were answering before about Cindy and the way that Cindy got to know um, Andrew and Myron so well. Um, do you feel, uh, working in their legal team, that it was part of your remit to get to know the men well, or did you restrict your knowledge to the intimacies of their case? Well... I'm sure everyone in the audience has a sense of, well, when you go to see your barrister and you're in court next Monday, you don't really need to exchange recipes. Mm -hmm. You know, you just, what are the facts of the case? How am I going to keep you out of jail or whatever? So you don't get to know them except insofar as necessary for the case. Yes. The bigger the case, the more you get to know them uh, often. Um, you know, if, if, if it's, for instance, if it's a, if it's a domestic tragedy, um, you need to understand what was happening in the house, so you end up knowing more about the house than possibly anyone else. Yes. Um, so, uh, with a case, at the beginning of that case, you wouldn't have thought, nine years later, I'll know these two incredibly well. You wouldn't have thought that. You, we had to run a case, a drug case, and we had to fight the death penalty for that case. But over time... They changed dramatically as young men. Like it or not, we were part of that. We were, like, every time I would go to the prison, I'd be carrying in books for uh, Myron, art books and so on, and, and, and people in my team. Um, uh, we had a group of lawyers, you know, uh, Veronica Hakan, Mick O'Connell and various other lawyers, um, Joel Backwell. I don't like to say names because now I've left out about five people. But we, we really operated as a team of about nine people. Mm. And we would carry things in, like books. And so, what are, you, what are you reading now? Why do you like it? What are you after? What sort of book are you after? So, half an hour of talking about a book that you really loved is a great way into someone's heart and mind. Yes, and you do it 30 times over nine years. Mm. And then you add in hundreds of conversations about how can we talk about your family life and put this into a legal document? How can we work with what you're doing in the prison now and talk about your personal changes? and use that to persuade the president that you shouldn't be executed. So, as that case unfolded, the legal strategy merged with the personal story in a way which is uncommon. Mm. And how did you see art changing Myron's life in the jail? Uh, I immediately thought of a very inappropriate image. You know, when you have a firecracker sitting somewhere just around there. Uh, Myron was um, a relatively typical prisoner, unimpressive person, uh, you know, caught up in on my own worries and injustices and selfishness for the first few years that we knew him. Yeah. And about 2008 or nine, he began to change and mature as the idea, well, I might spend the rest of my life here. I might be here for the rest of my life. And so we were definitely putting the issue in front of him. Do you want to have a life that's worthwhile or do you want to waste your life? Mm -hmm. Do you want drugs and gangs or do you want um, a productive life in prison? Not great, but a lot better than drugs and gangs. And so that's a slow process. I mean, you have to come to grips with the fact as a young man, well, I'm probably going to die here 
What sort of life do I want to lead? Mm. So then he began to teach, as many people will know, got involved in teaching computing and English and organising people like you or me or others to come in and, I mean, not me, but, you know, people with training in something to come in and teach philosophy. And that was going really well, um, but it went to an entirely different level when Ben Quilty and the arts, the art avenue arrived yeah. because... As we now know, although it wasn't obvious seven or eight years ago, but as we now know, he was a painter waiting to be, waiting for that to be drawn out of him. And once it started, it was a flood. And that really inspired every, almost every hour of his life. You know, he would get up long before dawn and draw. I think he used to maybe, I don't want to give the wrong facts, but he might have done two hours drawing every morning mm. before breakfast. Right. Wow before the routine of prison started, you know, so... And then a prolific painter. Um, and he started from a low base, a pretty low base, and mm. gradually learned to be a good painter. Mm. And uh, what he was saying in the last few days of his life was all about, if only I could live longer to paint more. You know, he wasn't saying, I want to live longer and have a wife and kids. He was talking about, oh, I've got so much to paint. Yeah. There are so many things I want to paint and I'm not going to have time. Uh, so, um, you know, he, goes, he used to do this, which was... It was I mean, I, I don't think it'll look funny now, but he used to go, Julian, I don't want to die. You know, play this game with me. And um, it doesn't sound funny now, but at the time it was funny. <coughs> and, Ooh, uh, that's some pretty dark humour. And then he would... Um, <laughs> Believe me, there's a lot of dark humour in the execution game. The, uh, and so it was all about, you know, I could be like an old painter. Is it John Olson? Mm. You know, I could be like him. Mm. Uh, and he was getting deeply attached to various uh, Australian painters and his, his dream was to have output. Mm. That's what he was living for. Yeah. So that's a long way from where we started. During the um, campaign um, and as part of his legal, legal defence, um, Sukumaran's paintings were used as a major argument for clemency. Why did you think anybody would care? Mm, well, again, uh, I mean, who knows less about sport than I do? But again, to use a sporting analogy, pick up the ball and run until the umpire blows the whistle. Yeah. Uh, so... It emerged as an idea, you know, it became... In 2009, I would have said, well, of course we can't do that, that's not going to help, that's nothing. But five years later, you've got perhaps Australia's best-known artist, Ben Quilty, mm. um, saying this guy is really good and this artwork is passionate and meaningful and fantastic to study. Uh, and then you've got people asking about that and then, you know... Um, in a, in, a, in a way which was um, probably pushing the boundaries of, of uh, what a, um, a, a, a lawyer might normally do, mm. um, we would be carrying the paintings out of prison mm. because who else was going to carry them out? And um, if we happened to turn them so they got picked up by international media and turned on the front page of papers around the world, well, so be it. Yeah. That became something to work with. Yeah. Um, and people were interested, and uh, probably lots of people here have seen Myron's paintings, especially sure. the last 20 or so. You know, in those last three days, on, on 24 April uh, 2015, it looked likely things were going to go bad. On 25 April, it was certain he was told he had three days to live. So he painted almost non-stop in those three days and nights. I'm not sure how many paintings, but probably about 20, and we would arrive in the morning and just start carrying them out. Mm. Um, and they were dripping wet. I mean, it's only very recently uh, that the black shoes that I had, mm. I, I think I must have thrown them out eventually, but for many years I had these little paint stains on them. I couldn't... Sorry, Dad, I should have polished my shoes more often, but, you know... Wow. Um, we'd carry them out and um, you'd have to hold them so you didn't cover yourself in paint. And yes. uh, Another reason to have them facing outwards. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. And, uh, you know, those paintings, 
They're like the face of despair, then you've got the face that's no face at all and you've got the heart with holes in the heart and you've got the head with the fetus body attached. They're all... Then you've got the flag, the, the red and white flag of Indonesia with the drop, dripping blood, which if you ever see that painting on the back is signed by all yes. the um, people who are about to be executed. Yes. Uh, they're very powerful paintings and um, there would be very few times in... This is a grand statement, but, you know, un until someone tells me I'm wrong, there'd be very few times in history where you have an artist who has got canvas and paints, a healthy body, capable of painting for 20 hours a day, and knowing that he'll be dead in three days. So there'd be many artists who know they're about to be executed in prisons across Europe in the 20th century, or even the previous two centuries. But not many of them also had great health and a cell to work in and all the tools they needed to paint mm. or draw or write. Mm. Um, you know, the, well, writing, we do see the writings of, of, of prisoners facing yes. death. But So there was my run in that unique circumstance with the, with the desire to create and to leave a mark on the world to show that his art was worthwhile... Mm and that his journey had been worthwhile. Julian, when Van Wynne was executed, um, you were involved in this very complex case in Melbourne, and so that lifted you away from Van Wynne's execution. How did the art that Myron left behind help you after his execution? Uh, well, it always makes me smile. I mean, a lot of them are gloomy, but, you know, when I look at them, I enjoy looking at them. I remember him doing some of them. I remember carrying many of them. And, uh, you know, the, the, so I, to me, despite the um, intense message or, or meaning in some of those paintings, they always, I enjoy, I enjoy looking at them. Yeah. Now, I'm going to ask you a couple of devil's advocate questions, and I'd just like to make it clear that I personally do not support the death penalty. But I do have people in my own family who are uh, deeply affected by drugs. Uh, my um, sister's family, her son, is a heroin addict. Um, he's been in and out of jail for 20 years. He has a son uh, with another heroin addict, a little chap who's now 11, and my own sister looks after him, so um, his, his grandmother. Um, what would you say to, not necessarily my sister, because she also doesn't support the death penalty, but there may be people who have been desperately affected by things like drugs and who gladly say, yes, drug traffickers should be executed. What would you say to them? Well, it obviously makes sense for people affected by crime to look for ways of, of dealing with their pain and, and grief. Mm. Um, and for clients like Myron and Andrew, we would never say they should not be punished for their crime. The only question is what's the appropriate punishment? And um, philosophically, I would be saying that the appropriate punishment is jail, not death. And I would say for all crimes, jail is enough. Mm. Uh, if I, if, if I had one minute to talk to those people who are so affected, I might not change their mind. But if I had an hour, almost invariably I would because I would be able to explain that even though you want to execute a certain person for a certain crime, um, what does that do to society when you look at death penalty generally around the world? What are you looking at? So you can't support the death penalty unless you're prepared to say, I support the execution of innocent people because there's no doubt that innocent people get executed. Mm. You can't support the death penalty without saying, I'm prepared to turn a blind eye to the incredibly brutal tortures that happen in many countries where people do get executed. Uh, because not in every country, but in many countries, the, ex the, the process of leading to the death penalty is, is a sign of other deep flaws. So... Um, There'll be problems to do with uh, torture upon arrest or corruption with, say, police or judicial officers or politicians, whatever. 
there'll be unfairness at trial where you, you don't speak the language at the trial that you're at. You don't know what's going on, but you're sentenced to death anyway. Um, you might be sentenced for a crime which you say, why is it a crime? You know, OK, I'm, 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 I'm gay and now you're going to kill me. Um, so if, if I had an hour to go through all of those injustices, the, the random, randomness of it, you know, so there are vast numbers of people on death row but small numbers of people getting executed. Mm. Who gets selected? Why? It's arbitrary, it's random. Um, it's not entirely random because the rich people are not getting selected. Uh, you know, it's the poor people and the minorities who get executed. So mm. the victim of crime who says, oh, I want that person executed, of course I understand that. In fact, I probably understand it better than most people because I live in a world of crime and, 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 and see the hardship up close and in intimate detail. But once you explain the whole picture, very few people say, well, nevertheless, I still want states to execute. I still want to attach my name to that. My other devil's advocate question is... I don't really think it's a devil's advocate question. Is well, it? Can we know, start I asking just... you some questions yet? No, no. <laughs> um, so my other question from this, from this other side of the argument is um, some people might say that Andrew Chan and Myron Sikamaran worked so hard to rehabilitate themselves simply because they had the threat of a death sentence over them and they tried to do that so that they th could then show the court, look, we're rehabilitated. Well, it's just a lack of familiarity with jails and prisoners that leads people to talk like that. Yeah. You know, you're in, what are they going to say if they do nothing? If Sukumaran and Chan do nothing and just sit there and take drugs and join gangs and bash people, the same person is going to say, I knew they'd do that. That's what prisoners like them do. That's, what people, that's why we should execute them or whatever. Mm -hmm. you, you know, you've got many crimes, especially crimes by stupid young men. Uh, you know, they're kind of half brain dead until they're a certain age. Um, in fact, I think the science is beginning to show that males' brains don't develop fully until they're 25, which would be a conservative estimate in my professional experience. <laughs> I have to say, um, Julian, in my own experience, having taken testosterone as a transgender person for the last three years, I feel like my brain halved as soon as I started to take yeah. it. <laughs> I know, it's just starting to grow back. Yeah. Well, I, I hope it does grow back. <laughs> Although it's pretty, pretty big now by the look of it anyway. Uh, so I've, I think I've got derailed. Oh, so oh, maybe they become, maybe they redeem themselves, try to look like this in order to save their own skin. Yeah. What really happens is you're 20 or 22, you're in prison, you're a year or two sitting in a cell trying to stop yourself maybe getting bashed or raped or whatever. You're trying to work out how to pay bribes so people don't hurt you. You're trying to get enough food. And... Gradually, you come to grips with the dilemma that you're in or the terrible situation that you're in. And lots of prisoners um, gradually come to follow a path where their lives improve and do better. And the, the scourge of drugs often derails people mm -hmm. or, you know, many of our prisons are warehouses for people with mental health. But putting aside those obvious things, like I can't stay off drugs... I can't deal with my mental health issues because it's never been properly understood or diagnosed. If you just take people who are not burdened with those problems and just say, I was a stupid young fool, I did do crime, so I regret it. That was 11 years ago or 13 or 15 years ago. Mm. What sort of life do I want to read now? I mean, how much time have I got? I don't know. That's what, that's what actually happens. Yeah. And... Um, the, you know, there are other boys uh, from the Bali Nine who are... Not every prisoner does that. Some people are just um, mm, lacking whatever it takes to take those steps. But lots of prisoners do that. You look at um, Matthew Norman and C.E. Chen are still in the prison at Dempasar in Bali, and they're both incredibly fine young men, you mm. know. Um, they're doing the sort of thing that we're talking about with Myron and Andrew. Yeah. Um, but they're leading lives that, if you saw them... I mean, I haven't seen them for a number of years, but in those years leading up to 2015, I was, um, I was in awe of their courage in facing the reality of what they had brought upon themselves and the decisions they had made as to how they were going to lead their lives, mm. which is I will teach, I will help, I will try and get 
um, people's lives better. They're all going to leave. I'm going to try and help them so they can get jobs when they leave. You're looking at men who were 18, who are now 30, living as mature, thoughtful, caring, sad, 30-year-old men. Yeah. Um, and so if I could... The person who says, oh, they're only doing it to save their own skin, well, firstly, there's nothing wrong with that. What's wrong with saving your own skin? Yeah. But in fact, it's not a fair... In, in my experience, of course, it must happen sometimes, but it's not a fair um, assessment mm. of, of what really ha happens, which is the transformation of a person. In fact, it's the people can change. Um, Do you see yourself as essentially an optimistic person? That's probably a day-by-day -day question. OK. <laughs> uh, OK, uh, I think next. I think I am. I'd certainly on, yeah. on big issues, I'm optimistic. I mean, yeah. I think it's critical if... We, we have to be optimistic. You look around the world now at the political situation in so many countries. Um, if, if we're not optimistic and we're not determined to make the world a better place, what we're saying to our children is, 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 is stuff it. You, you can have a life much worse than ours. We're not going to address that. So, you know, if you look at, say, the environmental movement, which I'm um, not involved in in any meaningful way, um, but, you know, the, the, the thrust there is to say, let's make the world better, not let it get worse... That's a whole... Optimism is built into all of that. And if you lose that optimism in, in legal systems, environment, um, political systems, then you're... In some fundamental way, you're breaching your obligation as an adult. Yes. Great answer. Um, I think it's time... I've got another... One more question, but it's possible that somebody's going to ask it anyway. It's time for audience questions. Um, I have a, a question for you as a whole. Hands up who isn't a lawyer? Oh, a lot of you. Oh, I was, like, totally expecting that... A particularly there just impressive audience. <laughs> That's great. OK, so Michaela has a uh, microphone, so um, hands up <coughs> if you'd like to ask a question of Julian. Oh, Dan here, Michaela. Um, just, just if you could keep your questions to questions rather than statements. Thank you. Question. Great. Um, what can we who aren't legalese, as in lawyers, do? How can we support a movement for a world without the death penalty? Uh, I have people in Melbourne who will be very angry at me if I don't give the following answer, which is... One thing you could do is make donations to our work. Uh, and that's certainly true. I think it's a really hard question. It's a bit like asking, how do I make the world a better place? I mean, I, I really warm to the idea, I don't know who said it first, of um, think global, act local, or think big, act small, you know. I think, uh, I think uh, at the right time, there may be a moment when you have to burden yourself with paying attention to your local politicians, presumably your federal politicians, but could be your state politicians. And when they... If, if, if some of them, you know, crap on in a stupid way about the death penalty, will take the time to, to say to them, you represent me and that's not what I want. There's not much that... Well, I don't know, obviously, who you are or what you do, but there's not much you can do about Iraq or Vietnam or China. And um, I'm involved in an international network where we try to do things about the death penalty. I think it's very hard. <coughs> but maybe think about it in the same way as, as the environmental issues, you know. Um, your, what you do with single-use plastic um, may not make much difference, but if everyone in the room did it and then everyone who knows everybody in the room did it, suddenly we've got a lot less plastic going around. I think about attitudes to violence, attitudes to state brutality... Um, the same spirit that I would engage with uh, the death penalty debate, I would like to see myself and other people engaging with um, children in custody, Aboriginal kids being detained in youth detention. I mean, it's, it's really all part of the same issue, which is how do we make a better world? Um, maybe you can't do anything about the death penalty, but by fighting locally about injustice in your area, 
you force a community to um, uh, improve have its understanding and have a better approach to justice generally. Uh, I wish I could give a smart, you know, one-liner apart from, you know, making donations. <laughs> I should say, you know, every, all the lawyers that you've met in Australia who yeah. work on the death penalty, um, and there's, there's not that many of us, there's like a dozen or so, um, all of us work pro bono. I'm just saying that because now that I've been crass and introduced money, none of us ever take any money for any of the things mm. we do. Um, but we do need money, like, to jump on a plane or whatever, you know. It was a great question, thank you. That was one of my questions. Anybody else? Julian, um, you mentioned Africa and the Middle East and Asia, but you didn't cover the United States. Can you give us some insights into where the death penalty is changing in the United States, state by state? Yes, uh, I can. Although I preface my answer by saying I don't pay much attention to the United States because there's about 10 million lawyers there who do. and. I read a statistic once that 99% of the w research done in the world about the death penalty is done in America for America. And, you know, that's probably close to my experience. So, America has the death penalty, but it's a state-by-state -state proposition. Um, it only executes now a relatively small number of people. So even though it's a huge issue, that's last year they might have executed 22 or 23 people. Most executions in America take place in a very small number of states, and not only that, within a small number of counties within a small number of states. So there's about four states that do it a lot, and within those counties. At least half the states of America either don't execute as a matter of law or policy, and there's a general shift, a general trend, to fight the death penalty at all kinds of levels. So at the medical level, nurses and doctors, at the legal level, which everyone knows, and of course just the general NGO kind of activity. So there's a, there's a sense in America that the death penalty will come to an end. Um, there's a sense that sooner or later it becomes unconstitutional at a federal level through the Supreme Court because you think about things like randomness, race, uh, and how the Constitution is meant to be working equally apl applicable to everybody, and yet the death penalty statistics and realities are very skewed. Mm -hmm. There comes a point, many people think, where America will just have to say, we just can't keep doing this. So I am optimistic about America. I mean, uh, the current... Um, president, you know, to the extent that he makes appointments, he's likely to be appointing people who are pro-death penalty. So uh, it might take a while, but uh, much, much bigger problem in America um, is things like life without parole. You know, there's 50,000 people in jail in America on life without parole, in many of them in conditions which are simply unacceptable. Uh, so... I, I say that because we should not talk about the death penalty in America without talking about life without parole. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's just another way of killing people. You put them in a, in a dreadful cell under incredibly harsh conditions and you say you're never leaving and uh, the range of activities allowed to you is close to zero mm -hmm. and uh, the lawyers who are trying to help you, there aren't any. Um, so we'll, we'll carry you out later. It doesn't matter how long it takes. Uh, There's just death penalty by a slow, a slow journey. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, can you hear me? Um, sorry, Julian, thank you and thanks, Ed. Um, I was going to follow up the question about the de death penalty in the US because I had the privilege of uh, meeting Brian Stevenson a few years ago. Um, do you two questions? Uh, do you think that the fact that the death penalty is legal in the United States adds a legitimacy to the actions of other governments around the world? And also, I'm old enough to remember the last um, execution in Australia, Ronald Ryan. Um, I just wondered if you could um, tell us about the social and political conditions that existed at that time that. 
um, led Australia to um, ban the death penalty. So, um, not so long ago, you would say with a straight face, um, America, however flawed it might be in some ways, was um, interested in leading the world with regard to human rights. And I'm sure I know as well as we all know that there are, you know, so many caveats to that. But nevertheless, America saw itself as being a leader in human rights. That meant that when you talked about America also executing, it had a significant impact on the debate around the world. You think of countries like Singapore or Japan or possibly some of the Middle Eastern countries saying, well, what do you mean we shouldn't be doing this? America does it. They're our ally. They're the greatest democracy in the world and so on. Um, without being too political about the wretched Donald Trump, um, you know, America has stepped back from assuming that leadership role and it's, a, it's one of the greatest problems of our time now is that vacuum that is, is being created. So maybe the debate has shifted to the point that people, countries like Japan or Singapore or other countries might say, well, we're not going to rely on what the United States says or does about that kind of thing to justify our, our own position. Um, it, it, it's incongruous that it, that it continues to execute. There's no doubt about it. And if America stopped executing, possibly under this president, I really don't know, he's unfathomable in so many ways. Well, not unfathomable, but I'm, on, I'm being recorded, so that's the end of that. But, uh, let's, let's just say they had a president in America who much of the world was pleased to say, this is my friend and I think he's an, he or she is an admirable president and um, he or she is leading the world in a way which is really something we've been hungry for. If that president and that country at that time abandoned the death penalty, that would have a very significant impact on the remaining countries. Mm -hmm. Bearing in mind there's only about 20 countries which now execute. The second question, the Ronald Ryan... Ronald Ryan's execution in February 1967, at that time, was not going to be Australia's last execution. No one knew that then. It was just part of an ongoing campaign. It just turned out that slowly the enthusiasm for executions petered, pardon me, petered out. Uh, and so, I, I, you know, the, the, what led to the end of the of the death penalty in Australia uh, is a story over decades rather than centering around the Ronald Ryan case. Um, I think in Victoria it probably um, it was just a, it was an angry debate, and there may well have been more executions, but for you know unfolding political story. I can't pinpoint it. I, I'm not sure if I've really understood your question, but I can't pinpoint it. I do have a Ronald Ryan story, though. Um, when he was on the run with his other prisoner, they were at a pub in um, Sydney at Coogee Bay, the Coogee Bay pub, and my grandma was uh, the barmaid there. <laughs> and she, she rang her, her son and said, you know those guys on the run from Victoria? They're here at the bar, <laughs> one at each end, and they're just watching everyone who comes in and out. And my uncle, her son, yeah, yeah, said, shut up, grandma, shut up. <laughs> and the next night she did it again. Anyway, she was right. <laughs> That's a good story. I think that's a pretty good place to end with a barmaid, don't you think, in Coogee Bay? Um, Julian, thank you so much. It has been extraordinary to have this privilege of um, being able to speak with you about such important matters. So thank you. Please join me in thanking Julian. Thank you. Thanks, Julian. Thanks.